want to thank Matt, our resident grill master, for providing and preparing the meat for our fiesta today. Also, a special announcement to Anne Marie and Michael. 40 years. 40 years. Congratulations, you guys. That's awesome. And one of my dear friends is here with us today, Christian. I gave him a big hug. Christian brought his parents today. We're glad you guys are here too. We love you guys. You <laughs> said, well, we miss seeing you and your parents. And you guys know how much I love our band. I, I'm not a, that, that, that has got to go. I just love these guys who I've been calling these guys for a while now until we come up with a better name. And I've been wanting to be part of the band, but as you know, I have no talent. But I borrowed these from Paige this morning. I kind of feel like I should just sit in on a set with the band. I'm even, I'm even using the terms right. So, okay, maybe, maybe not this week. Good. <laughs> That's all I got for announcements. So, let's worship with our great, awesome band here. We love these guys. So, oh, I can use an additional rhythm section. You can stay. Ah. Oh. Oh, yes, you know, that is kind of a violation of the rules. You didn't make it to practice. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> you know, um, Aristotle once said that knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. But considering how much myself is wrong about things that even I, I think I know, I'm not so sure that knowing myself is really where the wisdom starts. But in 1 Kings 3.9, um, King Solomon was praying, and he was asking, saying, give your, ser your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and distinguish right from wrong. Wisdom doesn't come from knowing ourselves. It comes from seeking God. And Proverbs 9.10 has the better language than Aristotle's because it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. The Lord is where our wisdom comes from. I, I, that was just what was on my heart today. Let's worship together. <laughs>
Thank you so much. You can all be seated. Well, good morning. Great to see everybody and hear great singing today. Man, everybody was singing awesome today. It was, that was great. You know, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but there are only half of the Klemps here today. Uh, Claudia and Jenny, Claudia's on the bowling team at, at her school, at Holly Schools, and so um, they had a tournament they had to run today, and so they're off helping with that. And uh, so this morning, they had to be there at 7. Our, I don't know, I've talked to some of you about our, yeah. Um, luckily, I'm a morning person. The rest of the family, not so much. Um, but um, our truck, our truck and the uh, less amount of words died. It's dead. So I had to pick, I had to take them down to Clarkston to the Cherry Lanes there and then come back. And so um, afterwards, I got to go and pick them up. So we're not, Trinity and I are here. We're not able to stay afterwards. But I wanted to say all of that just to say that that's why we're not here afterwards. It's uh, not that we hate Mexican fiestas, that's for sure. And, you know, look at my great shape. I always say I'm in shape. It's just a round shape. So, but... Um, so, so that's why if you see me, us running off afterwards, we got to go and pick them up afterwards. So, um, but, you know, what a great introduction that Jennifer did to today. You know, the words she said beforehand and the songs, you know, they're always, they're always really great at picking out uh, words and, and the songs that fit with what we're going to talk about. And uh, what she said just hit it perfectly because we started this new series of life in the real world. And... Now looking at the book of James and the practical, in-your-face advice that James has to deliver us through his inspired words. And I, I like James because of that, because it's just kind of in your face a lot of times. He doesn't seem like he, you know, he was flowery words or anything. He was just like, this is the way it is. You know, this is what you need to do, you know. And so I like that. And so the next few weeks we're going to be looking at life in the real world through James. And, and we looked last week at trials, you know, kind of did an introduction of James in the book of James. And we looked at trials and the trials that the people uh, during James's time were going through and how we continue to go through trials. Uh, you know, maybe not all of them are the same style or types of trials or maybe even as hard of trials, but we do have trials. And so uh, we looked at how how James said, we need to face, you know, God wants us to face those trials with joy. And how that is just, seems absurd when we think of trials and things that are going on in our life. And then today we're going to look a little bit more at that, at the trials, because he said, well, basically he says, you know, to face these trials with joy, you're going to need wisdom. And not just any kind of wisdom, you need God's wisdom. And so that's what we're looking at today, is looking at getting wisdom, God's wisdom in our life, so we can face trials with joy. 
And how many of you have ever um, sailed a sailboat before? Anybody? Oh, wow. Wow, that's a lot more than I was. I was about to make a joke and be, okay, how about a rowboat? <laughs> you know, I've done that, but not a sailboat. But a lot of people raise their hands with a sailboat. That's amazing. Or maybe you've been on a sailboat before. It's just kind of more, uh, sim- or more uh, right with a sailboat, but really any kind of a boat, if you think of it. And you're out in the boat. Uh, the wind and the currents can have a big effect on how that boat goes and, um, and how it drifts. And it could cause the boat to drift far from where you even want it to go. You know, and you really have to steer hard during those times to keep on your designated course. Because if you don't, that ship is going to go way off course and maybe even crash and burn. And, you know, and so you know, on those occasions, you want someone that is experienced at, at steering that ship in those hard times and those big waters and high winds. You want someone that knows what they're doing with that sailboat and, and so, or not even be there, but that doesn't fit our example. So, um, and so you want someone experienced there because it's relatively easy to steer a boat in calm seas. But it is altogether a different matter when there's 60 mile per hour winds and 30 foot waves coming against your boat and you're trying to keep it in the right direction. Well, it's the same with James. You know, as a veteran, really shepherd of souls and where he came from, James knew that it's relatively easy to lead a Christian life when things are calm. It's easy to do that. But it's, much more, it's a much more difficult prospect when the storms of life are hitting us and, and they're coming against us at full force. And a lot of times, we talked last week, we don't even realize that they come out of nowhere. The storms just come up, which we know happens a lot of times even on the sea. And so, you know, at those times, it's easy for us to get off course or to even make a shipwreck of our lives and our faith when, when those times come. And we saw that last week, um, James' readers were facing these difficult trials. They were being dispersed abroad, uh, mostly due to persecution, and they were suffering loss of their homes and family members and possessions. And, you know, many of them, even once they uh, fled, weren't, even, weren't uh, able to escape their persecution that they faced. And so James wanted them to know uh, how to navigate through those times, through those trials, so that they could endure. But not just endure, but endure joyfully, is what we saw. And so, you know, and, and we saw that last time. James really tells them, and in essence tells us as well, that we need to adapt a radical attitude when we encounter various trials. And that's not easy to do, but he says, and, and he said in verse 2, to consider all joy. And so we can do this if we understand our you know, reassuring truth that we have, that a testing of our faith produces endurance, it said in verse 3 that we looked at. But we have to, ref- we have to uh, submit ourselves to that refining process it said, let, us in, uh, let endurance have its perfect result in our life. It said in verse 4. And so, you know, there's this, this further ingredient, though, as we look at all this, that we need in order to endure our trials joyfully. And, and so that it brings glory to our God. And, and, and that is God's wisdom. And so James is telling us today how to obtain wisdom from our God and to obtain wisdom so that we can endure uh, these trials joyfully. So we're looking at James 1, verses 5 through 8. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along in there, but also up on the screens to follow along as well. Uh, Starting in verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. 
But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. So let's pray. Dear me, Father, I just thank you for this time that we come and worship you in your church. And we can come together as, as followers of, of you, of Jesus, and spend time with each other, fellowshipping with each other, growing our relationships with each other, but ultimately growing, growing our relationship with you through our, our praise and worship and singing and, and also worshiping by looking into your word and making it a part of our life. And I just pray today as we look into these verses of James that it not just be head wisdom, but something that transforms our life to something that is real and actionable so that those around us see that we're different and want to know about our God. I just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And, you know, so you know, James says in this, if any of you lack wisdom, and you know, he's not suggesting here, in case some of you maybe were thinking, that some of us have it all together so we don't need to ask for wisdom. That's not at all what he's saying. Actually, the Greek sentence here implies that all lack wisdom when it comes to this, especially to difficult trials. But we don't always see that. We don't see our need of God's wisdom. And so that leads to our first thing that we need to do is to obtain wisdom to endure tries, trials joyfully. That's a hard thing to say. We need to see our need. We have to see our need. And in order to even begin to have God's wisdom, we need to realize we need God's wisdom. And that, you know, seems like no duh, right? But there are many times where we don't think that. That's not the first thing that we go to when we face our trials. And, you know, we need to be clear with uh, the terms that James is using here. Because James is talking about God's wisdom that enables us to endure trials joyfully, which is what we looked at last week. And so, you know, it's just kind of a good point to remember that when we're studying God's Word, when we're studying the Bible, that it's crucial to study the text in its context of everything that's around it and understand the words that are being used in Scripture. And so this context of James 1, that wisdom refers to wisdom that we need to endure trials with God's joy in our life. And, so, and that's so that we will be perfect, as said in verse 4, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So you're, James realizes, you know, he was human. The people he, were around, he was around were human. He realizes that in the time of trials, you know, God's people often lack his wisdom to endure those trials with joy. We don't have what it takes. And so he continues in these verses, in verses 5 through 8, and says, you know, we can ask for God's wisdom uh, in times of trials. Now, of course, we can always ask for God's wisdom, right? It doesn't have to be in times of trial. No matter what we face in life, we can ask for God's wisdom. But the context here is focusing on asking God for his wisdom to endure these trials joyfully. And so enduring trials with joy just, like I said, goes against everything that's ingrained in us. You know, our natural inclination is not to face them with joy. And so when trials hit, we're, a lot of times we, we're prone to ask, like, why is this happening to me? You know, why me? But that's usually the wrong question. You know, sometimes God reveals that reason. Sometimes we may be facing some kind of uh, trouble or trial because of something we've done. And so maybe we do need to know why we're facing that trial. But, you know, that's not always the case. You know, often the answer to why we are suffering uh, we, don't, we don't know and may not know until maybe we get on into heaven and find out. But then important questions to ask when a trial hits our lives 
is more importantly, how can I understand this trial from God's perspective? And how can I navigate through this storm in such a way that brings glory to God? You know, how can this trial help me grow closer to God, closer in maturity? There's a pastor that talked about how he had a secretary that was going through a difficult trial, going through tough times. She had had a stroke and so was struggling with her life. Her husband had gone blind and he had been taken to the hospital where at this point, as far as they knew, uh, that was where he was going to die. And so the pastor saw this woman in church on Sunday and he assured her and wanted her to know that he was praying for her. And she, she startled him by asking, well, what are you asking God to do for me? And he said, well, I'm asking God to help you through this time and to strengthen you through this. And, and she said, well, I appreciate that, but I want you to pray for one more thing. I want you to pray that I will have the wisdom to not waste all of this. And so the pastor said, you know, she understood the meaning of James 1.5. You know, the reason behind these trials. And it helps us to understand also when we look in the full context of wisdom in the Bible and, and even the Old Testament meaning for wisdom. Because James was steeped in the Old Testament. You know, he used that a lot. And the main idea for the Old Testament wisdom was really that of a skill. Uh, it includes skills for people that made the garments for the priests of the time, and also those who worked with metal and stone and wood, you know, people that had skills. And, but it also extended to those that could plan and execute a battle plan and make that happen, that could lead a government, and people who could assess a difficult situation and persuade people to take that necessary action. And so it really, it spoke to people that could speak well and use their time carefully and, and manage things in, a, in, a, in the right way. And so rather than just the, some theoretical understanding, Really, biblical wisdom focuses on practical living in obedience to God's will. And, and again, and so that should tell you something because that's the whole book of James. That's why, we call, that's why we called this series what we called it because it is practical. Uh, James, the whole book of James is about practical living in obedience to our God. And so... You know, that's how we look at this, looking at wisdom. And, you know, we see in, uh, in other places in the Bible, in Job, it talks about the fear of the Lord that is wisdom, and, you know, that Jennifer talked about. That, and to depart from evil is understanding in Psalms 111. And so by wisdom, James is talking about the skill that enables us to, to live obediently before our God even in the midst of trials. And that result will be a truly beautiful life that glorifies our God when we do that. And so we have to see our need for wisdom in order to drive us to supply that need of wisdom in our life. But, you know, by nature, we're kind of all self-sufficient know-it-alls, you know, in life at some point. You know, I can do it on my own. I don't need your help. You know, I, I used to have a friend that, you know, I would, I would say to her all the time, oh, can I help you with that? And she's like, I'm a strong woman. I can take care of this. I'm like, I'm not asking you because you're a woman. I'm asking you because I want to help you, you know. Um, it wouldn't matter if you were my brother. I'd ask you if you needed help, you know. But that's just how we are. You know, we're in America especially, you know, the rugged individualism, self-made man, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But, and, you know, and, I, and I'm sure that really in any culture, uh, they idolize the strong person of the group. You know, that seem to have it all together by themselves. And because pride is a, a, a pandemic of the human heart, no matter who you are. 
or where you're from. And so to come to God, we have to humble ourselves and admit that we don't know what we need to know in order to joyfully face these trials. And in fact, you know, the, it could be the main reason that God is allowing these trials in our life to begin with in order to humble us from our pride so that we look to him in time of need. You know, we look at the uh, Laodicean church in Revelation. They thought, you know, they were rich. They had no needs. You know, they were well off. They could do it all. But God's view is that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind. Yeah, and so... So really, a prerequisite to obtaining wisdom from God is to recognize we need God's wisdom. And, you know, at first we think, well, duh. But when we really look at it, it is something we need to remember. But then second, to obtain wisdom to endure trials joyfully, we need to know our God. And uh, what I would like you guys to do, for those that maybe are new or newer to to having me speak. Um, every once in a while, I like to have you just kind of talking with somebody that's next to you, or if, if you're sitting on your own, just kind of thinking about a question that re relates to what we're talking about. And so what I'd like you to do is just for a few seconds, talk with someone sitting next to you. Where do people go to obtain wisdom in life? Where do people generally go for wisdom? All right, so just take a couple seconds to talk about that. I was just thinking, I wonder how many of you said Google. You know, <laughs> and I didn't have this planned. You know, uh, if you ever, if I'm ever speaking, like sometimes when I'm speaking, it just, you know, and I think, and it doesn't, this doesn't have to do with Google, but I think some, you know, when I'm speaking, God lays things, even I have this all planned out and written out, you know, but there are times where God just lays things on my heart, even while I'm speaking. And so if you ever, like, like I'm talking and I'll just stop or, or maybe stumble a little bit with what I'm saying, a lot of times it's because I'm like, wait, there's, there's something else here, you know, but that's not this, but because it's Google, but uh, so many times in life, you know, we say, you know, what would we do without Google? Like every single time someone says, ah, oh, you know, who, who was the president, blah, 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 when that happened? And you go, yeah, let's Google that. I mean, that is the first thing we do. I mean, everybody, everybody does that. But so, you know, there's lots of ways that people are trying to to get wisdom in life or get knowledge in life. And, but what we're going to look at in our text are three ways that we have to know God in order to obtain wisdom. And the first is, is that we need to know that God is the source for all wisdom. You know, to ask God for wisdom, you know, obviously implies that he can deliver. You know, the Bible states, you know, plainly in, in Proverbs 2, 6, I think I gave that to them. It says, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth came knowledge and understanding. And in Proverbs 21, 30, it says, there is no wisdom and under, or understanding or no counsel against the Lord. You know, in other words, if worldly wisdom contradicts or goes against what God says, then it's a false wisdom. It's not wisdom at all. Only God's wisdom stands. You know, the word philosophy comes from, and I probably could have Dave come up and just talk about this, right? But, um, but the, and he's probably gonna afterwards be like, well, really what that means is this, but, um, but the, you know how Dave is. 
Uh, the word philosophy, though, comes from two Greek words uh, that mean the love of wisdom. And, and you know, I've, I've looked, you know, and I, I had to take philosophy classes in college, you know, my bachelor's degree is in education. And um, I discovered that worldly philosophers are not really so much in love with wisdom. They're in love with their own wisdom. You know, that's really what it boils down to. They're, they're not interested really in how to live wisely, especially before a God, you know, and for us, our God, the God, um, whose existence a lot of them question or even deny. But rather they are wise, or they're showing how wise they are by being able to win arguments with other people. And so, you know, writing to those people, you know, to those people of the time that took pride in, in those Greek philosophers, you know, Paul even contrasted the, the so-called wisdom of this world with God's wisdom. And, he's, and he, he, he uh, related it to the cross of Jesus. You know, he said that, you know, where, and he said this sarcastically, you know, where is the wise man? You know, where is the scribe, the, the debater of this age? You know, has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know, the world's wisdom is foolish. And so many times, you know, we get caught up in that of what feels good or what people say is right. But God's wisdom is what's true. The point is, is if you have not come to the, as a sinner to the cross of Jesus Christ and obtained his mercy through, through faith, then you don't know God and, it's, and you can't obtain his wisdom because it only comes from him. You know, we look at all the time, Romans 10, it says we need to, to trust and believe in what Jesus did for us as sinners, that he died for us and rose again for our sin, for our wrong, and that we need to make him our Lord, the one that we follow. He's our king. And so we can't know that apart from God. And so how does God impart that wisdom that we need? Well, we need to know that God reveals his wisdom by his spirit and through his word. You know, God's wisdom doesn't come from some big flash, a light, uh, light bulb over our head, or um, some in, uh, impression that hits us out of nowhere. You, you don't find it in Dear Abby or Reader's Digest unless something like that accidentally puts something that coincides with God's word in it. But God's wisdom comes directly from God and is revealed through his word. It especially centers in the knowledge of Jesus. And, and it says in uh, Ephesians, in whom all hidden are the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. All comes through him. God reveals his wisdom by his Holy Spirit to those who are spiritual. You know, that wisdom has, uh, has to do with knowing and applying God's word in our life. Knowing how to apply biblical truths into a particular situation in life. And so if we're not spending consistent and uh, regular time uh, learning God's word, then we're not going to have the wisdom that we need when those trials hit. The time to seek wisdom from God is before any calamity hits. And we see that in Proverbs as well. A great way to, to start that is, you know, just taking time to read God's word and, and seeing how it can apply. But maybe uh, working with somebody else on like, a, you know, we might call it a one-on-one -on -one discipleship where you go through the word of God and you, you partner with someone to help each other learn the truths of God's word and, and applying it and having accountability of applying that to your life. So knowing that his wisdom is revealed through his spirit and through his word. But then we also need to know that God gives generously and without criticizing all that ask him in faith. 
You know, if verse 5 says that God gives to all. Uh, but we need to define that all because, in, again, that context that we talked about, right, as always. God doesn't give with his wisdom to everyone in the world, but to those that will believe in his son and ask through faith. And James emphasizes that the manner in which God gives is generously, without criticizing. And you know that generously is kind of the nuance of simply. He just simply gives it to us. It's without any kind of reservation. We ask, he gives. He gives because he delights in giving to his children. He wants us to have these things. You know, and that you know, goes along too, uh, in, as far as context, is people will use this to say, you can ask God for anything, and whatever you want, he's going to give it to you. And that's not true. In the context of this, in God's wisdom, when you ask, he's going to give it to you. Without criticizing, which means, you know, that he, he doesn't say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, again? You need more wisdom? Really? You know, I just gave what you needed a week ago, and now you're back bugging me again. You know, God doesn't, doesn't operate that way. God never makes you feel cheap or irresponsible for asking again and again and again. Rather, he invites us to ask for all the wisdom we need. And I mean, we all probably know somebody like like that, that um, you ask for a favor, and if you're like me, like if I have to ask someone for a favor, I, I'm at my lowest point. You know, it's just tough for me to ask for favors for, for whatever reason. And it shouldn't be that way, especially with friends and, um, you know, within a, God's church. But it's just tough for me. Uh, um, but have you ever had someone that You've asked the favor for, you, you know, it takes all you can to muster it up. You ask them a favor, and they say yes, but then the whole time after that, they spend complaining that what they just had to do for you, and, you know, or making you feel bad, or making sure that they're going to get something back, or, you know, you're going to make this right, you know, and that's just the worst feeling in the world. But God is ready and willing to lavish his wisdom on any child of his that asks for it at any time. And so that leads to uh, the means for obtaining wisdom from God. To obtain wisdom, to endure trials joyfully, we need to ask God in faith to meet our needs. And there are two parts to this, really. First is obviously we need to ask. You know, he says, you need to ask me for this. And the verb here is really a present tense verb. It indicates that you, you probably need to ask and ask and ask. Not because God is the one that's not doing it right, but because we're not getting it right. And so we need to ask more than once to obtain what we need. And it's a simple command. You know, let him ask. He needs wisdom? Ask. You know, there's no magic formula, no special incantation or words that you have to use or mutter. You don't have to wait for a special time of the year or someone that says that things lined up right in your life to do it. You know, he, he doesn't say, well, you know, let him work for this. We'll give him a little bit, but let's just let him work for it or let him buy his wisdom. No, it's, it's not for sale. It's free. It's a gift. And we just have to ask. And we need to ask of God, of course. You know, in verse 5, you know, every single one of us that, that is a follower of Jesus Christ can approach our God directly. We don't need someone to go through, whether it's a pastor or some, an elder. We don't need those people to do that, to ask God. We you need those people, just say. Um, but, you know, uh, we don't need to go to God through anybody. We can directly ask our God, our creator, for wisdom. And now, 
What I'm not saying is that it's wrong to go to a spiritual, mature, whether it's a pastor or a counselor or, or you know, someone of that, uh, that way that can help you and direct you in God's word for wisdom. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, for years, and, and I think a lot of times it came out of the church that it, 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 it was shameful if somebody knew you had to go see a counselor or, you know, get some kind of uh, counseling in, in, those, in that way. And there's nothing wrong with that when that person is directing you through God's word for wisdom. But you don't need to approach God through any human if you know Christ, you could ask him directly at any time. You know, the Bible never tells us to pray to anybody else, whether it's a saint or any other person in the Bible. It never tells us to look within ourselves to decide to do what, to what we should do based on our subjective feelings. And it certainly doesn't tell us to consult with a worldly psychologist or a horoscope, or, or dear Abby, in order to get our answers. Peter tells us that God's divine power has granted us everything pertaining to life and godliness. We see that in Second Peter. Paul assures us in Ephesians 3 that it, in Christ we have boldness and confidence that we can access our God through faith. So when you need wisdom to endure a trial uh, in, in a manner that's pleasing to God, we go directly to our God in prayer through the, through the mediation of Jesus Christ. And that's all. We can ask him directly for wisdom. And, and, and his word, and, and when you look into his word, we can ask for that direction through his word and what we need. He promises that he will give it to us generously. You know, some, some Christians might make the mistake of saying, well, you know, I'm just not worthy to ask God, you know, to grant something that I need like that. Or I just sinned too many times. I've, I've messed up. I've failed too many times. Um, and so really, I, don't, I can't ask God for wisdom. He'd probably laugh at me if I did that. But really, you know what that is? That's an excuse for disobedience. An excuse for maybe even unbelief. Every Christian has sinned. Every Christian will fail. Every Christian really is unworthy. It's only through Jesus that we have the forgiveness to approach our God. And we don't come, based, we don't come to God based on our holiness or our worthiness. We come to God on the merit of Jesus Christ and what his blood has done for us. So since God commands us, he commands us to ask him for wisdom, we're disobedient or unbelieving that he can do it if we don't ask for wisdom. And then we need to ask God in faith without doubting. Faith is essential in approaching God. In Hebrews 11.6, it says, And without faith, it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And, you know, that in a way, that's kind of just, when you think of that, it's silly to ask something of a being that you aren't sure even exists, Right? Or if he exists, you're not really sure if he cares about your situation or what you're asking. Or if he even has the power to grant that to you. So to ask from God, you have to believe he exists. He cares for you. He cares so much. He sent his son Jesus to die for you. And he's able, he has the power to give you the wisdom that you need to endure your trial with his joy. So if you doubt God's existence or his ability, then uh, to give you that wisdom for your need, James says you're like the surf of the sea. You're driven or tossed by the wind. You know, there's a great song by a band called uh, Jacob's Trouble called Wind and Wave. 
where it talks about like that. When we're not putting our trust and getting our wisdom from, from our God, we're depending upon our world's wisdom. It's a, we're like a boat tossed in the wind and the wave, just back and forth. And it's, and, you know, if you think of that, you know, the surf has no inner power or principle to direct itself. It's totally at the will of the wind. And, and it can, it's completely unstable and chaotic, just like our life when we don't trust in God's wisdom. It can be a destructive force as it batters a boat against the rocks. And that's a picture of a person who lacks faith in God. There was someone, uh, she was popular, or, you know, well-known. Popular is probably not the right word, but well-known. Uh, late 70s, early 80s. So some of you might have remembered Joni Erickson Tata. Um, she was paralyzed from the neck down from a diving accident when she was 17. And she uh, was a follower of Jesus and became a speaker and a writer and um, really used her life to affect people for Christ. And um, she had this to say about her, her accident that had happened. She said, uh, God used that to prove himself to me as well as my loyalty to him. Not everyone had this privilege. I felt there were only a few people that God cared for in such a special way that he would trust them with this kind of an experience. This understanding and the end of it left me relaxed and comfortable that I could rely on his love, exercising newly learned trust in him. I saw that my injury was not a tragedy but a gift of God in order for me to use to help conform to the image of Christ and to reach others for him. Something that would only mean my ultimate satisfaction, happiness, and yes, even joy. You know, that's God's wisdom in her life. You know, to endure a major trial with joy. She didn't get that wisdom from the world. You know, she didn't make it up on her own or getting out of her gut to be able to do that. It came from God and his word. So if you need God's wisdom for trials in life, for how to endure major things that happen with joy, all we need to do is ask him in faith, and we'll get it. Let's pray. Dear me, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word that you put people like James in our, in our uh, lives really through your word that just hit home hard that it's so easy for us to look at things in our life and just have the woe is me attitude or I, I can't believe this is happening or why this is happening. I just pray Lord that we look when we face trials in life of how we can use that to grow closer to you, ask you for wisdom as we go through those trials so we can face it with joy. And I just pray that through each of the things that we go through in life, that it will be to draw us closer and others closer to you. I just thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being here. Um, so this morning, for those that are regular attenders, uh, I just want to remind you about our offerings and uh, tithes and offerings. If you're here in person, you can give at the box in the back or that we have our online giving on our website as well. Um, if you're a visitor here to, to the Journey Church, thank you for being here. Take some time to go to the cafe uh, as, as you exit from here and get a visitor card, fill it out, and we'll just send you a letter thanking you for being a part of our church this morning. And then, um, as you guys know, we're doing our Mexican fiesta today and, um, and the Bible study afterwards. And so I have been given this note 
It was like, kind of like uh, after you read this, you have five seconds, it's going to destruct, you know, type of thing. Oh, and, oh, no, Jennifer just said, I need to talk slower. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so I was talking slower. No, um, uh, well, that's good because I just lost my train of thought now what I was saying. And I said, oh, yeah, Mexican, thank you. Uh, Mexican fiesta and then the Bible study afterwards. Um, so I've been given this note that uh, I have nothing about. I talked about it last week. I said there's something special that's going to happen. And um, I had no idea what it was. I still have no idea what it was. But I was told to read this note as soon as David is ready. We're having technical difficulties. So, you know, everything went great for the service today. So that can't just happen for David. He has to uh, um, figure things out all the time. Yeah, no kidding. He's between him and Jennifer and Ken and Robin as well before service. If you guys are ever in here, they're running around. And because it, you know how technology is, it does not go the way it's supposed to go. I actually, um, again, I'm stalling here. But um, I, did, I set up this meeting for the parks meeting, for Holly Parks meeting. I went down early, set it up. I had the guy zoom in early, so I made sure it all worked. It came to that meeting, and every single piece of that fell apart. None of it worked. And so I understand. I feel their pain. It's rebooting. Give us a second. Got any jokes, Dave? Do you want to correct me on any philosophy things? Yes. Brotherly. That's right. Philae is brotherly love. Oh. Would you like me to do that? I don't know who to look to for that. Want me to pray for that? Okay. All right, yeah, so I'll pray for our meal, and then, then whoever needs to direct after our thing that's going to happen, we can just do it. All right, yeah, great idea. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your church, and that uh, we have a church here that cares about, obviously, a connection to you, but also a connection to each other that is so important, Lord. And um, I just pray that we take times like this to make those connections with people that maybe we don't know as well, but also uh, grow those relationships with each other closer and, and just let this be a reminder that we need to do this outside of our church as well. Just make those connections with each other uh, to be accountable to each other and uh, encourage each other in, in that brotherly love. And, I just thank you for this food today, that we have the opportunity uh, to eat that together as fellow Christians, but also to um, thank those that took the time to prepare it. I know many hands went into putting it all together and, and getting the food ready uh, so that we can enjoy that. And I just thank you for those people here at the Journey Church. And I just pray that it's a time of great encouragement to each other, and then the Bible study afterwards as well, uh, be a time that we grow closer to you. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not used to being a long-winded preacher, so my prayers aren't really long and wordy. But, okay, so we'll pretend this is the end of the service. So what I would like you guys to do now and I don't know why, but you need to do this. Uh, I need you to stand for our invitation for everyone here today to stay. Okay, you can make this fun by clapping along. The words will be on the screen for you to follow. You're not required to sing. Just clap in uh, rhythm for Jamie's sake. Um, but you're not required to sing. But this is your invitation today to stay. <laughs> 